Welcome to One Leg Up, where we discuss how you can deliver the very best customer experience and how you can achieve zero marketing waste. I'm Ed Davis, the Chief Operations Ninja here at One Leg, and today I'm joined, as ever, by Vic Sun. Vic, how are you doing today? Really good. We're really busy, and this is an exciting topic today. So, you know, looking forward to uh, us doing this, and I think we're going to switch roles today, right? We are going to switch roles. Uh, Vic is the mastermind here at One Leg, and, and usually he I'm interviewing him, or, or collectively we're interviewing somebody else. But today, as he just foretold, we are going to switch roles, and Vic's going to interview me because we're going to discuss a subject that I am personally uh, passionate about, and that is client agency relationships and how agencies can get and build a better relationship with their clients and how clients can get the very best from their agency. Yeah, exciting topic. I'm sure a lot of our subscribers are are going to be very interested to know, you know, about how to do to, to do this better. Uh, and, and I'm sure a few of them will be laughing with some of the examples that maybe they've they've experienced themselves or, you know, some of the faux pas uh, that maybe they have committed. Yeah, 100 percent. It's it's a it's a topic that is fertile with 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 anecdotes. Um, and in, in all seriousness, it is a topic that needs to be addressed because in my, my view, the relationship, the agency client relationship has deteriorated over the last couple decades and it's incumbent upon organizations and agencies like ourselves and some others to try and get that back on track. Yeah. And, and, and you always hear like, you know, um, people talking about, you know, you should use us or, you know, this is the age, like we're the right agency for you. But, um, you know, uh, I think, you know, we did, we did a little bit of, of research as well, but there's not a lot of, uh, well, how do you, when you get there, how do you, how do you go and manage that relationship? So the expectations are, you know, uh, it's a relationship, it's tricky, yeah. you know, there's no procedure or manual for it out there um, that can be used, you know, in, in, in principle for every relationship. So I think this is a very interesting topic. Um, so, you know, it's a fascinating subject for me, you know, because I mostly come from the client side of things, you know, dealing with vendors and agencies um, in my past life. Um, so let's start where you think the agency client relationship is today. Yeah, I think, you know, there's for the most part. It is. The word that jumps to mind is settled, right? It's 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 not. It's, it's not fantastic. It's not horrible. Um, but and maybe a, a more, a better word might be adversarial. I think in the last couple decades, <clears throat> as you, uh, even for small organizations, uh, small businesses that work with agencies or agencies that work with small businesses, more and more, you get people who are on the supply chain side, the procurement side, they are the ones who are managing the engagement with an agency and, and it becomes this adversarial volatile relationship because the procurement people, they're looking for one thing in a relationship, right? They, they are very structured. They are very binary in, in their approach to contracting with an agency. It's what is the price? What are the terms? What are you, what are the deliverables and how are we going to hold you accountable to that? And, and they've done that because there's a long, 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 long history of essentially agencies making all sorts of promises to other communications professionals on the client side. And then you get into the actual work and for a whole myriad of reasons, you know, that work changes, the scope of work changes, the actual deliverables changes, and, and everybody looks up after a period of time, six months, a year, five years, and they go well, we gave you hundreds or millions of dollars worth of work. We got a handful of ads. What did we actually get for that? And so with the advent of, of analytics and data, you know, more and more people are able to look at, you know, the return on the actual investment. And, and you know, there are acronyms that we throw around with clients or that clients throw around with us in terms of MER, ROI, ROMI, this, that, and the other. And that has started to guide and color what the relationship is how it evolves and how it's managed. And to me, that is part of the reason why it has in fact deteriorated because 
we are all humans, whether it's the procurement people, whether it is the CMO on the client side, whether it's the owner of a small home improvement company, everybody's humans. And you can't just look at uh, a spreadsheet and make a decision of how you're going to interact with other humans based on, on a data set. It, it, it just doesn't work. And so to me, <clears throat> and we'll talk about it, I'm sure here in a minute, that's where it currently is. I think people manage their agency relationship and, and sadly agencies manage their client relationships uh, based on a P&L statement. I really hate to say that. We don't do that. We absolutely don't do that. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, being a part of one leg became very attractive to me is because we have a different view of what that should look like. We have a different view of what the interaction and the relationship should be between client and agency. And, and a, a determining factor, an influencing factor is not based on what the last invoice was. It just isn't. And, th and that's where, that's where it should be. Yeah. You make some really good points there. Um, you know, it, it sounds like you've had, you know, extensive experience where, you know, the, the, the agency is, is being managed through, through numbers um, and through spreadsheets and maybe through that attribution, you know, you lose sight of really the relationship because there's other factors involved that you can't fit neatly in a spreadsheet. Um, Correct. A lot of, a lot of companies don't realize that there's, you know, that relationship, you know, there are opportunity costs, um, and as well as other outliers, you know, who's handling your account, the relationship there, um, the value adds it, you know, um, they may do for you that they don't report on, um, you know, the additional services, you know, kind of the bedside manner, um, their team, you know, the way that they, they, they use, uh, your company's, um, uh, goals as part of their strategy. You know, these are not quantifiable uh, typically on a spreadsheet, you know what I mean? And, and I agree with you. I think that's, that's a, that's a good way to do that. So, you know, my, my follow up question is historically, where's that relationship's been? Yeah. So historically, you know, you, you, for, for those who, you know, like to hearken back to the days of Mad Men and, 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 you know, the, the heyday in, in New York and Los Angeles and Chicago, even then the, the relationship is adversarial, right? Because at the end of the day, we are, we, we, we have different priorities in, in a sense, right? The client typically is trying to grow their business, and I say typically because there's there are obviously instances where somebody comes in and they're trying to protect their business or, or something along those lines because of a crisis or, or issues management. But let's focus on, on predominantly what agencies, whether you're a PR agency, whether you're advertising a marketing agency or a brand agency, you're typically brought in to help grow a business. One way or the other, whether the client positions it that way or the client realizes it, that's what you're doing. And with that, the client is determined to extrapolate, to extract as much, extrapolate, extract as much intellectual capital and as much creative capital and as much um, manpower out of your agency to further and meet their goals of business growth. The agency, on the other hand, historically, their primary driver, and this is where the conflict starts, their primary driver is to extract as much money from the client as they possibly can for their intellectual capital. And the, pro the, 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 the disconnect becomes the agency believes those ideas, that creative, those deliverables are more valuable than the client believes. Right. And so, so there's always been this, this, this really interesting push pull dynamic between agencies and clients. Now, the difference is the, 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 the spending, you know, because we didn't have a lot of analytics, we didn't have real time data that we can monitor down to call centers and the number of people who are actually in the store and POS systems and all that kind of stuff. 
you know, th- there was a there was a significant lag between, hey, we 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 engage this ad agency to come up with a Super Bowl commercial. And at what point do you check in to say my one million dollars got me X amount of business that would take weeks, if not months to do nowadays? Sorry. So going back, so it was really easy for essentially agency and client to feel like they were getting what they wanted out of each other. Agency felt like they got a fair price. Client felt like they got a fair amount of deliverable. But as we shift and bringing it forward to to now and going into sort of this adversarial in constant conflict dynamic, because the client has access, literally real time information about how their products and sales and their services are selling. And in a lot of instances, the agency is one or two steps removed from having visibility to that real time data. The agency is now at a disadvantage, right? And so the, the, the CEO of a company can look in real time uh, at their Google Analytics, at their Shopify account and go, well, you know, we, 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 we initiated a new campaign We're we're two weeks in and <clears throat> we've only sold X amount. And the agency is applauding itself because we did great creative. We came up with wonderful positioning. We came up with a great contact content strategy or media strategy. And, and we sold that into the client. We did our things. But now the client's sitting there watching these things sort of in real time and, partic- and potentially going, this isn't working, this isn't working, this isn't working. And the, and the agency's sitting there going, oh, that was great work. Let's make a case study out of that. Let's go, t- right? And then they meet, you know, after a month, after three months, and the agency goes, oh, we're going to get more business. And the client's coming in, they're going, no, we need to, we need to rethink this. And so it's just this constant battle between, you know, what it is the agency thinks that they're providing, what it is the client thinks that they're getting. And, and there's, like I said, there's a disconnect between those two things and that, you know, that, and that has been highlighted even more so because of the availability on the client side to essentially real-time analytics. And that's helped to deteriorate the relationship as well. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point about, you know, uh, attributing the numbers in real time, which I find, you know, most companies do not have data scientists. You know, owners are are, are quite, um, you know, in, enthusiastic when they see, see the numbers, but they, they don't, you know, they do mostly correlation. And and I think one thing that stood out in, 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 your, in your overview was, um, really, the real time may not coincide with long term as well as um, mid range goals or, you know, effects, right, you know, true caused effects from the creative from the content strategy that you mentioned, you know, from what the agency feels, you know, well, look, there, the effects will be felt over a period of time. And I think a lot of companies discount um, the fact that many campaigns you know, there's a trickle effect of positive uh, results that come in mm. over the course of time that cannot be predicted or projected uh, simply because they may not have those, you know, models um, sure. available. They don't have people in their team who can forecast those things. And so they live in the now and they live within the the numbers that, you um, you know, I'll say this with a lot of, you know, assertiveness, most of them really don't understand or use correctly. And, and, and I think, um, you know, you made a really good point there. And and some agencies are not equipped for that, you know, they they may have, yeah, they may have, you know, reporting structures. But again, they don't have a data scientist, you know, Um, they don't have an you know, anal- you know, analytics experts who can really forecast these things, right? Or, um, you know, people who have degrees in e- econometrics who can actually come up with complex, correct mathematical formulas that, you know, can be explained in a simple way to to the owner, CMO, C- C- CFO. So that's a really good point here. Um, well, well, and just building on that, Vic, so, you know, you, you actually highlight a point, which is, 
which I see as potentially this this little death spiral that a, a number of facets of the communications industry finds itself in. Um, and, and that is this clients, um, companies, you know, they don't necessarily have data scientists and, and, and analytics people and, and things like that as well. If you think about, you know, fortune 500 companies, absolutely. They will mo most of them in, in one way or the other, they will have access to somebody who can interpret the, 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 the various data sets and, and, um, data streams that they have. But the vast majority of agency accounts are not Fortune 500 companies. They, they aren't even Fortune, I don't know, a million companies, right? They are small to medium-sized businesses. A lot of them do less than $5 million a year. And, and the majority of them are spending less than, you know, a half a million dollars on all of their communications efforts, including salary for an internal marketing person. And so what happens is <clears throat> the agencies have an expectation that, or excuse me, the clients have an expectation that agencies have that th those capabilities and access to all of these platforms that can analyze the data streams and, and provide correlation analysis and all that kind of stuff. But that all costs money. It's not cheap. And the agency with the introduction to procurement people whose only mission in life is to maximize the contract value to their benefit and and usually that means they're driving down the cost and so when you have an agency that has to acquiesce to reductions in fee right uh, very few agencies that i know of are are in any sort of position in the last five years or so to actually increase their fees, even on a cost of living basis. It just doesn't happen. What, what, isn't happen, what is happening in, is actually the reverse where fees are being driven down because of negotiation. And so when you, when you, when you drive down the fees, agencies can't offer the same level of services. They can't bring in the same level of expertise, but yet the clients are still expecting that that exists. And so we just have this really weird cycle of it continue again, it's one of these deteriorating forces that we see in the agency client relationship. The expectation is here and agencies would love to do that, but they also know that clients aren't necessarily willing to pay for that. Yeah. Another great point there. Um, you know, kind of the opposite direction. And again, I think it's because they are trying to commoditize the service. Um, but the reality is when, when you do better for clients, um, you know, you, at, at least for, for us at one leg, we expect that when we, when we service client, we're always going to do better and provide more services. And that means, you know, there's going to be, you know, um, um, fees attached to that. We're not going to drop the price. We're going to increase it because the level of service continues to increase. Um, and yep. I think that's training. And I think we're going to get into that, you know, the future, uh, of, of where relationships need to be. You, get, you gave a great overview, the history of client agency relationships, um, how that's transitioned now because of, you know, um, data and uh, the proliferation of, you know, more of these uh, reporting systems that are available. Um, but there's still that um, question of level of uh, understanding Right. As well as the bandwidth that companies have in understanding data uh, or at least, you know, forecasting and and, and not accounting for uh, the trickle effect and, and, and all the, the, the things that they um, that the, the customers at clients. Right. Um, are able to benefit from uh, sure. but are not reported on. So let's uh, let's look forward. And and where does the relationship need to go and what can clients and agencies do uh, you know, to work better together? So I think the, the first step, right, is, is recognizing that there, there is a challenge and, 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 and clearly that is happening, right? The world's coming out of, um, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a period of time that has been debilitating to, to businesses, agencies in particular. And so everybody's re reassessing, you know, what the world looks like, what we need to do 
to, to operate and, and what we need to do to grow. And so from my standpoint, you know, I think there is, this does provide an opportunity for the, the world to get better when it comes to agencies, clients, and their relationship between one another. And where I start, right, is you have to look inward. And so what I would say is, I would encourage the marketing industry to be transparent. This is an industry that is rife with um, not secret books, but you know, there, there's, there's, there's the books, there's off book, right? And you know, it's things like we talk about. I just saw, um, I just saw a uh, an interaction between an agency and a client today because I was helping, I was helping another agency owner out and, uh, his client didn't realize that they were charging them 25% on, on the media fee, 25% unheard of, um, in reality. And I, and I would say that's a bit greedy, but it's things like that, that contribute to the degradation of that relationship. And it's fair for an agency to command a fee for the work that they do, um, but that needs to be a fair fee. And so that leads to to my point. I think there needs to be a level of transparency that is injected into this business, not our business, but the agency business that would in fact be refreshing. And I think if you have that level of transparency, you can then start to set the the terms, if you will, of the relationship. And if you sit there and do things like, you know, we're media agnostic and therefore we don't charge you a fee. What we care about is the, the, the actual agency fees, the billable fees for our people, you know, not necessarily the fact that, you know, we, you want to spend a hundred thousand dollars and run that through our, because that's a pass through cost. You know, I, I've worked for plenty of agencies where the, the bigger deal was getting the actual fee, not necessarily the 10% markup on the media, on the media buy. Cause you know, that, that just sort of comes without saying, I think the other thing is we need to get back to this place where people actually pick up the phone. People actually meet in person. People, people still go back to whining and dining. So this isn't a pandemic issue, but this is where, you know, over time and email and texting has become more and more ubiquitous that has provided a filter that has provided a screen and a barrier to actually having a human relationship. And so I think on an agency side, if you want to build better relationships with your clients, pick up the phone, go and see them. Now, some agencies are going to say, well, geez, Ed, we're, we're an international organization and, and our office is in New York and, 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 and most of our clients are on the West coast or they're in Chicago or they're in Houston or or they're in Spain. Yeah get on a plane. It, you would be amazed uh, the, 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 the way in which you can increase your relationship by actually going and spending a bit of time in your client's office, taking them to dinner, taking them to a ball game. Like that kind of stuff just does, it, it, it's starting to get pulled out. And the reason is, like I said, procurement sit there and says, I, we, we need you to charge us less. So the agency says, okay, what can we get rid of? We're not going to get rid of our creative people. We're not going to get rid of our account handlers. Well, don't take them to dinner. Like we, we can't spend five hundred dollars on a nice dinner for 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 the ten people on our client team. We just can't do it. So, but I would say that's where you should start on the client side. And and it's tricky. My wife does the procurement side, right? And she negotiates contracts with vendors um, for, for the company that she works for. So I understand it from her perspective, why the procurement, uh, why the procurement people have to have a role in these things, but clients should really look at that process and don't just rely on the procurement people to interact with the agencies. When you are in these formative stages of, of getting proposals and, and whatnot, I've seen it a number of times where a client puts out like an RFI uh, and, and a group of agencies submit 
and essentially it's the procurement people and they're basically looking ticking off a box okay do they have this service do they have that service are they do they have this geographical coverage whatever the case may be and then when you get to the rfp stage it's still the procurement company who is ma managing it but now they're looking from a cost benefit analysis right this is how much this agent wants to charge us for this scope of services mm, that is a deviation from this mean blah, 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 blah. Therefore, our analytics tell us we need to go with this one. And then they let the marketing team know this is going to be your best opportunity. Or in an ideal world, they'll say, well, these two are going to be your best. You go pick. Where I think that that really needs to be is a marketing person needs to be the front person or a communications person needs to be the front person. It can't be the procurement person. Now the procurement people will say, well, we do that because we want to create arms links so that the marketing people can't be influenced, but because they can't be influenced, how are you supposed to know as an agency, how are you supposed to know at a from a client standpoint, are you going to get along? Cause what's really important in building the relationship is what is your culture and values on the client side? How does that, um, match the agency client and values because that's a really important piece we haven't really talked about it but the best client agency relationships happen when there's this little magic dust that gets sprinkled and you find commonality between the cultures between the the visions of of how, who they are as organizations and where they want to go and their value set and so and and you sadly you don't really get that come through from procurement people, but you can pick up those cues when you talk to a communications person at, on the client side. So, you know, I don't know how helpful that is. That's just a couple things I think each, each side can do. Um, but I, but I'm internally hopeful that, that the relationship can get better. Uh, I certainly don't think it can get, it can get any worse. We are privileged to work with a number of clients who, who do share our same values who do share similar cultural characteristics and we've been reasonably successful since we launched one leg last year. Um, and, and we do, we go through great pains as Vic, maybe you want to talk about Omotanashi and what we do to make sure that those client relationships are, are aligned. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, speaking of the Amatanashi principle, you know, customer is God. It, it, it's really, it doesn't really boil down to the numbers to be, to be honest, you know, uh, procurement as well as negotiations, you know, those are all kind of numbers based, which I think, you know, you made a great point there that the relationship really isn't going to be quantifiable on a spreadsheet. And, and that's really where, you know, the relationship being, I think the most critical will be a huge factor in the success uh, of executing on a campaign or a marketing deliverable. Um, and so I think with us, you know, we take the stance that um, we will do things you know, that is uh, without having to deal with the numbers, meaning we will, if it means advising a client, visiting them, doing something, um, we don't necessarily need to do a cost value benefit analysis, uh, even though we could, right? And a lot of companies will do that. And, and, and they'll, you know, and it's interesting because, you know, um, you know, I've, you know, I, I've studied a lot. Uh, and when it comes to statistics and analysis, one thing that I know for a fact is that, you know, one, you know, a lot of people who, who happens to know the spreadsheets, you know, people who, who know the analytics and the statistics, they're given a lot of uh, power and authority to make decisions over these things. When what you said is, should be the focus, you know, if you're dealing with a marketing company a agency, you know, having the marketing person or the communications person speak to that, to them and lead and guide that and make those decisions as well, or be part of that, because somebody who's in accounting, or procurement, you know, they only look at things on a numerical level. They're not doing it from the human level. They're not because they're not built for that, you know, and it, it never surprises me when we go and, you know, go to a boardroom and the person who has all the spreadsheets and the statistics is, happens to have all the credibility. But the person who is most effective in dealing with the decision is not the one who has the spreadsheets, right? Is not the one mm. who has the analytics, right? It's the person who understands the human elements the most. 
Um, and you know, again, nothing against accountants and people who are good with numbers. Um, but it's a certain personality type. Um, no, and they, they are humans too. Yes. Let's, let's, let's be clear. Mm -hmm. Um, but they, they have a very specific skill set, and they were brought into an organization for a very specific purpose, which is to detach the emotion of from rational decision making. And, and, you know, we, we won't get into it here, but we talk about it at one leg, a number of agencies talk about it. Uh, you certainly can read more about it on our blog for sure. Again, we are humans and we, we are not just purely cold rationalization uh, machines, nor are we these sappy emotional beings. We are a combination of those things. Everybody is, no matter whether you work in accounting or you're the, you're the, the graphic designer uh, in the creative shop. Uh, and, and, and that's an important bit. And I think, you know, to sort of wrap it up and, and what you were saying, whereas we need to get back to, to injecting and, and, and having a, the right balance between the rational and the emotional in the decision-making and the management of relationships between clients and agencies. And I think that that's, that to me is the biggest takeaway from our podcast from this podcast. Yeah, it, 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 I, I'm sure, you know, a lot of people will have, you know, uh, questions, or may we may want to, you know, to to consider like, you know, uh, extending this or maybe going and doing more because there's a lot of questions um, come up good ones. And we you did a great overview of this. Uh, so thank you for that today, Ed. Yep. So that's it for us today. We hope you've enjoyed our chat and learned a couple things. As always, we are here at One Leg Believe Poor Marketing Pollutes the Planet and that business is full of tired, outdated, indistinct, unremarkable, and underperforming marketing that sucks. But what sucks even more is that many companies have forgotten the most important thing of all, the customer. We at One Leg are on a mission on behalf of our clients' customers to change just that. To learn more, go to our new website, zeromarketingwaste.com, where you can subscribe to our blog and this very podcast. You can also find us and follow us by looking for the Flamingo and the One Leg Handle wherever you socialize online. Thanks. Talk to you next time. <laughs>